I think we'll start um, and we'll get the conversation going, I think, um, and then people can join us. So welcome everyone to this um, fifth and final webinar in the Leading in the Library uh, webinar series. It was, um, uh, this one is looking at um, developing a financially sustainable mindset. Um, and we had um, a range of other webinars that we looked at in this series, including developing a strategic mindset, developing an entrepreneurial mindset, gender balanced mindset and developing a culturally sensitive mindset. So this is the fifth and final webinar and I'm delighted to um, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I think most people will be familiar with the Leading in the Library program, but Fiona perhaps um, less so. So just as a sort of brief introduction, it was essentially a one and a half year program um, partnering ca uh, between Capital Horizons and INAS um, to help to strengthen and build the capacity of our library consortia partners. Um, and then we looked at three critical areas. We looked at helping them to strengthen their leadership, their strategy and their influencing capacity. Um, and what we did in each country was have a series of face-to-face -face workshops or forums where we took a progressively deeper dive into those issues um, and there were many um, Capital Horizons advisors who supported that process um, went out and visited the countries including Simon including Dan um, and um, many people who were involved as well in the webinars um, such as uh, Peter so um, it was um, about 13 people from Capital Horizons were involved in the program um, advisors and staff and about seven staff from INASP as well so it was a genuine sort of collaborative um, uh, effort to support and strengthen um, library consortia capacity. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce um, Dan, um, who has played an instrumental role in uh, the Leading in the Library program. He's visited Uganda, he's visited uh, Kenya, and visited Zimbabwe. Um, so he will be well known to um, um, the participants who are joining us today. Um, and Dan has a huge amount of experience in terms of leadership, in terms of strategy development at both um, board level and uh, NGO leadership level, and also has a huge amount of experience of running small businesses um, and uh, helping helping businesses to grow. And so that sort of um, that understanding and insight into financial sustainability has been invaluable to our library consortia partners. And it's great that we're able to um, come together and share some of that learning on this webinar. Um, in terms of the agenda um, today, um, a very brief introduction from me, um, and then from 11.10, Dan's going to uh, focus on the key cultural ingredients for financial sustainability and success. Um, and then there's going to be a Q&A discussion with um, participants. Um, and then Dan will go into a value model approach to financial <coughs> sustainability, followed by another Q&A and another session on a strategic approach to financial sustainability, and then a Q&A session. Thank you, Kamal. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and um, see all, all your lovely faces. I, I've had the pleasure of working with all of you in 2017. So um, I, um, I think apart from Kanye, I've, I, yeah, I've certainly worked with you last year. Um, so thank you for that. And it was a great time. Um, so as Kamal said, we, we're going to focus on um, a financial sustainable um, mindset. Um, and we're going to obviously take a um, library consortium perspective on that but uh, a lot of what we say hopefully will um, be valuable for other charities and organizations as, as well because we, we, we like to share this with as many people as possible um, I really want to encourage you to participate as much as possible I've tried to develop as many um, points for you to input so I you know please you know the more you can give to this process the better the process will be um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction and then I'm going to um, sort of dive into the presentation. Um, when Kamal asked me to do this and, and when I put a bit of more of my um, time and attention to it, I realised that uh, um, I've been trying to create financial sustainability for my whole life, my whole working life, probably for my whole life, um, starting from about the age of seven when I um, was quite a successful mushroom entrepreneur in my village, um, managing to pick mushrooms from the local farmer's field and selling it to all the doorsteps in, um, in the village I lived in. And um, I think I was probably the richest seven-year-old in my village for um, probably about a 10-mile radius. Um, so I, I real, realized at a very young age um, how to generate um, 
profit, I suppose, and, and, and income, and, um, and lots of the techniques um, re required in, in, in income generation and getting funding. Um, and I've continued that um, process for the, re the whole of my life. Um, a lot of it has been um, African experience. Um, I've been involved with um, lots of women's groups in the Gambia, the, um, um, helping them with vegetable marketing. Um, I've been involved in, the, in Ghana with a, a community Shia butter um, enterprise that was quite substantial. Um, in Malawi with um, a, um, a micro credit and revolving loan fund, which um, I now believe has over 60,000 um, clients involved in it. Um, I was only involved in the early stages, but um, you know, I, I, I spent quite a lot of time on and off with that organization in Malawi. So lots of different African experiences, many um, others as well, which I, um, I've, I've probably forgotten and would like to remember, um, but that's my age. And um, the same in the UK. Um, you know, I've been a businessman for, for 15 years and um, had to um, make profit um, in, in that business. I've also been involved in the charity sector in the UK um, um, as a social entrepreneur and in social enterprise, um, trying to create profits um, for charitable purposes. So throughout my life, I've, um, I've been trying to um, help organizations become financially sustainable. I've also spent a lot of time in Europe um, fundraising um, with foundations, with the EU, with governments, um, and writing proposals. So I, I've had lots of different um, tasters, really, that are, have all come together um, in, in this um, um, presentation we're going to talk about this morning. And, and that's where the tricky bit comes. I remember um, one of our advisors, John White, who I think you all know, said strategy is um, it's, um, it's simple to understand if you boil it down, but it's not easy to implement and, and, and carry out. Well, it's the same with financial sustainability. Um, it hasn't been too difficult to, to boil it down to its key ingredients and, and the important elements, but um, it's a lot harder to actually do. And it's a constant um, thing that you have to do. Um, Every, every week, every month, every year in an organization or as an individual. Um, you know, you're only as good as um, you know, the month or the year that you've just had and, um, and then you've spent the money, you've used the money for um, charitable ends and then it's gone. So um, it's, it's a constant process. But um, I've, I have managed to boil it down to, to three things which hopefully you will find simple to understand and which will generate discussion. Um, and then I'm interested to hear what you've got to say from your experiences because Although I brought it down to three things, I think there's a lot more um, that can be added to this and that Capital Horizons can then use and share um, with all the charities and clients it works with. So what we're going to cover in this webinar um, is, um, oh, excuse me, I'm just trying to make the presentation move, is looking at a financial sustainability mindset and um, three main areas which I think um, go, go towards helping that be, um, be successful. And the first one is I'm gonna look at cultural ingredients and the key cultural ingre ingredients for financial sustainability success. Um, I'm then going to share with you a value model approach to financial sustainability success, which again, I think when you see it, you'll think, oh, that's obvious and that's simple and I really get that, but, um, we all, we, we all forget um, this approach, I think, very often in, in, in the melee of, of, of our hard working lives. Um, and I was just explaining to, to Lorna this morning that I've, I've actually probably adopted this value model approach in my life, in my working life, for my whole life. And I didn't even realize it until I spoke to Lorna this morning. So that's the beauty of talking to people and, and collaborating. But um, I've, I've always, um, you'll see more, I'll explain more when we get to, um, to point two. And then um, um, I'm a great believer in strategy, and I think you have to take a strategic approach um, if you're going to be successful um, when you want to you know, take a financial sustainability approach. So culture, strategy, and a value model uh, are, are what we're gonna um, look at this morning. And um, I think that fits very well with our Kapler Islands model as well, where we talk a lot about culture um, and um, strategy as two of the key elements um, in, in, in strategic change and the successful strategic change. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to look at um, the first element first and um, look, look at some cultural ingredients. Um, for me, the culture is all about an entrepreneurial spirit. It's about entrepreneurism. It's about having an entrepreneurial mindset. And um, 
I think there's five um, key factors there that um, I've picked out, which I think are essential, and which I want to, you know, which I'll share with you. Um, these have been developed with um, some of my advisors and colleagues and cap horizons as well, but um, they're what I firmly believe in. And within the entrepreneurial spirit that they are, I think in an organization, as an individual, you've got to have that in entrepreneurial intent. Um, you've got to create that entrepreneurial culture in your organization. If it's not there, um, if it's seriously lacking, um, you will not be successful um, in your financial sustainability without dealing with this, this issue. I also think, um, you know, it's a very active, creative um, process, which involves a lot of collaboration. So, you know, the entrepreneurs are not people that, that work in isolation. They're not people that, um, you know, don't talk to people. They don't, you know, they don't get out and get out there in the environment, see what's going on, see what other, other good ideas people have. Um, and it, it's all about ideas and it's about brainstorming and it's about, you know, maybe putting yourself in small groups and, and really bashing around the ideas until you're really happy with what you come up with. So, and it's a constant proactive and creative process. Thirdly, it's, it is all about learning. It's a continual learning um, process. Um, most of the best ideas and most of um, the things that you can utilize the, the best effect in your organizations, they've already been thought of. Um, someone's doing them somewhere else. Um, someone's already um, been down that road um, before you. So, you know, it really is about getting out there, talking to people, about trying to research, read, um, and learn. And then I, I, I think, you know, it's all about passion and commitment. Um, you know, it, it, it won't happen without, without that exuberance and that um, excitement and that, you know, real, you know, I can do this, I want to do this, you know, really show, you know, exhibiting your feelings and your emotions about, um, about why you believe, um, you know, the approach is right, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is important, um, the idea that you've come up with um, is going to make a difference. So you've got to have a lot of passion and commitment um, to be successful. And um, like I, I'm going to touch on further, you know, you've got to have a strategy and you've got to take action. So many people talk about it and don't do anything. You know, even if you just take a small step, even if you just try and um, raise um, you know, I don't know, a very small sum of money as your first step, um, as, as an income or as a fundraising initiative, take it, um, try things. Um, don't be afraid to take a step and, and probably fail uh, more times than you succeed. So you know, have a plan, but then get on with it. Don't just spend all your time on the plan you've got to take action okay so that for me is the first area that will lead to financial sustainability success an entrepreneurial spirit and having the right culture in your organization that will lead lead you to financial sustainability and um very simply that for me is you know, you've got to have vision you've got to have ideas um, you've got to look long term forwards you've got to have passion you've got to have people involved you've got to get commitment and buy in and then you've got to take you know you've got to take action so you know, we share we share this this vision passion action um, approach um, with the people we work with at Capital Horizons a lot but that, that sums up really what what an a great entrepreneur and entrepreneurial spirit within an organization is all about having those three elements in balance equally in balance vision passion and action and if one of them is out of balance um, and it's a relative score you know you need to probably attend to the ones that are that you score lower and then you score higher so if you think you you've got lots of ideas um, and your passion is there but the action is not well focus on action and vice versa okay so we've also spent quite a bit of time at capital horizons um talking about entrepreneurial spirit and going beyond those five um five key points that i've raised and we've come up with um, um 
the success blueprint to entrepreneurial success. Um, we use it quite a lot in, in, in our essential series. And um, the, the S stands for shoe leather. And um, it's about putting your shoes on the ground, getting out there, talking to people, building relationships. Um, if you just stay in your office, if you just stay in the building, if you just stay in your room, nothing's going to happen. You need to get your, you need to get out there, and you need to meet people um, to have success. Um, when you are raising income or generating income, or you you are asking someone for some funding or some support, um, you really must think: Is it appropriate for all your stakeholders? It might, it might be a good idea for um, one, one, one stakeholder, but if it isn't a good idea for all your stakeholders, I wouldn't um, recommend you following that approach. Um, because you know, when you start brainstorming all the different income generating activities that you could um, part participate in as an organization, if you do a good job, you can come up with 10, 15, even 100 ideas. You can't do them all. Which ones are, which ones are really gonna be appropriate for your stakeholders? And like I've already said, um, is the funding that or the income that you're going to generate a good cultural fit for you? Um, take the extreme, you know, um, a lot of charities would be very uncomfortable about getting funding from um, a defense contractor or a, a tobacco manufacturer um, or, or, you know, um, engaging in an activity um, which, which you know, ethically just does not fit with, with your culture and, and, and all your values. So that's very important. And um, when, when, you're, when you're trying to achieve financial sustainability success, it's absolutely vital that you're, you're very clear about what you're doing and communicate that to all the people that work in your organization and are involved in your organization and they understand why, why you're doing that income generation activity or that um, financial sustainability approach and how you're going to do it and make sure that everyone's bought into it. And it requires a lot of communication, good information, and being really clear. And um, finan you know, generating finances, creating financial sustainability requires an awful lot of energy. Um, it takes a lot of time. You need to understand that you need to be prepared. The people you ask to, in to participate and to take part in, in generating income they need to understand how much effort that's going to take. Um, they need they needs periods of time where they can take downtime, um, when they, they can re-energize, and they need lots of support. Also, people need autonomy when you're fundraising and when you're generating income. Okay, If you want financial sustainability success, you need to, to give your team enough scope to act and to make their own decisions. Things crop up. People will offer you things. People will do things. Um, opportunities will arise which you weren't expecting. So uh, that clear autonomy um, with certain ground rules and guidelines needs to be in place. And finally, um, it can be really stressful, th th this process. It, um, it feels like a great weight and level of responsibility when you're trying to generate finances and, and income for an organization. And so you need to make sure that everyone's bought in, everyone's supportive and the right help and support is there. And that, you know, at times when people are stressed, that you know, the right management approaches are taken to, to, to help them through that. So that's my little easy to remember um, um, other way of looking at entrepreneurial spirit and success. Okay, so we're going to hand over to you. I'm going to ask you um, two questions in this area um, and hopefully that will generate some interesting dialogue. The fir first question I'd, I'd, I'd like to throw out to everyone is you know, which rooms in the Kapler house might you find entrepreneurs in and why? And it's not a trick question um, and I'd be very interested to hear, hear, your, hear your opinions on that. And just to say, everyone, um, if you um, can, uh, if you could look on your screen, you'll see an unmute um, for your microphone. Um, so that will enable you to talk. But if um, you can also type um, a response to Dan's question as well. Yeah. 
I've particularly chosen this this question because I, I think um, you know we were talking about creating a culture, creating teams, and um, so um, I think it's a very good. What have we got there, Gene? Peter's got his hand up. <laughs> Peter, um, what, what would you like to say? Uh, well, thank, thank you very much, Dan. I found that really helpful, really interesting, and uh, helpful mnemonics and things. Um, to answer your question, I think it's all the rooms in the, in the house are needed. And you've, you've made clear that you need a strategy, so that fits into the top left, the, the sort of rational planning bit. You've talked about vision in the, in the uh, observatory, top right. Um, people uh, are a clear element uh, in, in the family room in terms of making the relationships which you've emphasized. And then clearly all this talk about energy and stress, you know, there's a lot of kitchen stuff going on as well. So um, it seems to me like an awful lot of things are important in life. Uh, you really need all four uh, rooms of the uh, Kapla house. Um, but maybe you can sort of slightly change the question to uh, what sort of person is most likely to uh, be most successful? Is it a, in, in, in raising money? Is it a person who is predominantly in one room or another? And there I don't know. I mean, my, my stereotypical image of a fundraiser is up in the kind of outgoing visionary top right uh, room of the house. But, but I'm not sure. So that, that's my, my answer to your question. Thank, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I, um, when, I, when I was thinking about the answer to that question as well, ultimately I think that the answer from, from me would be all the rooms. But I also um, um, focused on, on the second part of what you just said. And um, I have a feeling that um, possibly the, the leaders in, in that, that group of people or, or, or the the preferences which you need to engage first of all are, are around the observatory and family room sort of preferences um, where you have the passion and the vision um, and the ideas and the creativity but ultimately you then need to engage the preferences of, of, of kitchen and library to, to get it done and, and have action and, and have the, the evidence and the logic and, and the impact um, Sort of statements that will, will, will make it far richer um, so possibly it's just a, an order of sequence and, and obviously as we we can use all our preferences can't we in, our, in ourselves but um, maybe a, having a team um, to champion the different rooms might um, as individuals might be a, a good way forward we have we had a comment there Jean, did we? No, that okay Anyone else um, got a reference on the Kabbalah house? Ian? I, su I suppose um, I was just going to add that um, I think there's <coughs> different levels to it, isn't there? I agree you need um, to be occupying all of the rooms. Um, and yet part of me thinks um, Sometimes you can do that w within a team, sort of portioning out different skills, can't you? So, for example, some people might have great ideas, but are not really very good in the communication and engaging people department. Um, so that communication person would then be going out doing that, but being supported by a team behind them, which has come up with the ideas and maybe can then ground them back into a, a reality of like well you know measurement success all those sort of left hand side of the room qualities so to me i think it's not everyone has to have everything you, you do need to occupy all the rooms but that can be done in different ways and part of me thinks well i would say that wouldn't i because i'm a family room person however i do think it's um you know to put a team together can be really useful if if, if you don't have all of those skills yourself because often I think thinking of um, you know the, the stereotypical observatory person that they might be so away with their own ideas that they they can't communicate so I'm just kind of putting that out really is anyone else like want to comment on the Kapler house um rooms and um, on, on the entrepreneurial spirit or shall i move on to the next question 
I'm not seeing any <laughs> any hands up. I, I think you could move on to the next question, Dan. Okay, all right. I, before I leave that question, though, I obviously I, I think this is a really important um, thing to take on board. Um, um, you know, when, when you're um, trying to create that entrepreneurial spirit and, and the cultural ingredients um, that might be necessary. So um, yeah, that's why I flagged it. Um, the second. The second question in, in, in this section of, of the presentation um, uh, is a practical question, really, to um, the consortiums. And, you know, what actions might you take to foster an entrepreneurial spirit for a library consortium? I think it would apply to any um, charitable organisation as well. Um, but what practical things can you actually do to make this happen? Um, I'll raise my hand Dan, and just sort of some reflections on obviously I don't have a deep deep understanding of library consortia but uh, you know we like you have I've worked with them for the last couple of years um, and um, one thing that I think um, is really could potentially be really useful for a library consortium and other um, is to carve out a space within that organization that allows you to come up with creative ideas and to foster that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. So I think it's not just about saying an organization needs entrepreneurialism, you also need to provide the space to enable entrepreneurialism to happen. And that's, um, that, and it would just be interesting to hear from any um, of our library consortia participants if they feel um, or anyone from INASP, if they feel there are current structures within library consortia um, that do provide that space. For example, as Dan, as you know, there are the working groups um, that library consortia have, um, and there are working groups that look at financial sustainability, and are they the right sort of places that cultivate entrepreneurialism? And I guess that's a sort of a, a, a question as well. Yeah. No, I totally endorse that, Kamal, about create, you know, creating the processes of the thinking and the space um, for, for that to happen. And whether it's board time, in reports, exchanges, scoping visits, learning time, uh, brainstorming sessions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and also the leadership actually leading by example and, and exhibiting that entrepreneurial um, spirit as well. But um, yeah, I'd be very interested to hear if we've got any um, consortium members that would like to say something at this point okay Lorna I just wonder um hi love more I know I know you haven't got the um the mic on um I just wondered if, if from your experience um your consortium had um put anything in place that um may have demonstrated that entrepreneurial spirit in your library consortium I know you're very entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kanye, you've got your hand up. What, what would you like to say? Yeah. Kanye, did you want to say something? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we Hi. can. Hello, my name is Sheila uh, from Zook. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Sheila, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I'm using Mobulu as his uh, ID, Kanye's ID. Um, at Zook, uh, the bibliographic work group is hosting this year training workshops for RDA for colleges and polytechnics and charging a fee. This is a way of raising at least some funds for Zook. And this is what we are doing currently. Excellent. No, that's, that's very, very interesting. And um, we were just asking Sheila whether um, what actions um, your consortium could take to actually um, create a, an entrepreneurial culture um, you know, and to encourage financial sustainability. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask Rory Sang Sebata to try and answer since it's a bit of a difficult question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think what you spoke about, about creating that space for, for critical thinking and um, creative thinking is what Zopis has been trying to foster for, for quite some time now. And I believe we, we're really working hard to try to have people that can bring brilliant ideas so that we can push them and, and try to create 
some 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 you know money making spaces good good does anyone else like to comment Anne, you've got your hand up now get a pair of it. Um, Sheila and Sabata in particular, did anything come, you were going to ha start having conversations with industry following the forum in December. Do you know if anyone, any groups taken that up and how, if you've got anything you can share about that? Not, not yet. We, when talking to industry, I think the problem, what happened, you know, the political space we wouldn't you know, go straight to industry as it were at this point, but I think that's something that we really are trying to work on. You know, to say now with the new dispensation coming, we'll be able to then go back to industry and, and, and talk to them and sell our ideas as so. Yeah, and I've just noted that there's a, um, a comment from Lovemore that came through in the chat. Um, and Lovemore says, yes, a team in the consortium would need to come up with a strategy um, for an entrepreneurial spirit it would be interesting um you know dan I, I know you sort of talked about the formula for an entrepreneurial spirit do you think um that's something you know a, a strategy for an entrepreneurial spirit how you how you might enact enact that or anyone else um, yeah no I, I have given that some thought thank you Kamal. um no i mean i think it's very important um that, that you have a strategy but i think the starting point is is for understanding the consortium's culture as it is, and um, really understanding whether you, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is already embedded in the organisation or not, um, and how it would, you know, how you'd want it to look like. Um, so maybe having a, a number of facilitated sessions on on actually what your culture currently is and what you'd like it to be in terms of financial sustainability and an entrepreneurial mindset. That's the starting point. Then, then obviously um, you need to create, you know, you need to identify a leader and a team um, and you need to then, um, um, that can carry this out and then you need to move on to developing a strategy. But, you know, and like you said, you, know, you need to create space and processes and time um, for that to then happen. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, getting into detail, you need to, you know, it needs to go into things like how you lay your website out, you know, if you're going to t if you're going to take an entrepreneurial um, approach to, to to your culture, you need to think about take it throughout the whole organisation, um, including how you lay your website out and and how you you know how you um, come across in lots of different ways. Maya and Lorna. Okay, we've got some ha more hands up here. Um, my, um, uh, you want to speak? Uh, yeah, it's actually Veronica that wants to talk. I was just raising my hand. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a question because I, I observed this with CLISC actually. My feeling was there. Yes, there is a working group for fundraising, for really looking at the financial sustainability for CLISC. But when talking to the people from other working groups, then I had often the feeling, oh yes, there is also some entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. They are raising already funds in a in a smaller extent for their own working groups. Mm -hmm. Then, do you think that is something that should be encouraged by an organization, or are there any risks that um, yeah the, the the organization would lose the control? What what is your thinking about that? My, my initial thoughts, Ronika, are that you know everyone needs to be singing from the same hymn sheet, and you need to have joined up thinking, um, and that's where a, a, a plan, a strategy, is very helpful. But we also said it's important to have an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, you know, a, a cult in the culture, which, which applies to everyone. Um, so you do want everyone to to buy in and have that spirit, but but it all needs to um, be focused around an agreed plan. Uh, and that everyone's comfortable with. That would be my, my answer. I don't know if others would like to contribute. Uh, and Elona's got a hand up. Yeah, I, I was just going to... Um, uh, oh, I, I was just going to ask Fiona actually to, um, to broaden the discussion. Um, I, I was conscious that Fiona is um, from an organization that's working in different countries doing development work and um, from what I've observed in that organization, 
some people have this entrepreneurial spirit, like a person called Frank in, in, um, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, for instance. So I was just thinking, um, Fiona, widening it out to another organization from your context, how, what, do, what do you think you can do to um, foster entrepreneurial spirit? And, and maybe it'll be useful to the INAS people as well. Well, I've just noted um, here, bring Frank to Kaplor meeting in Nairobi in April. <laughs> <coughs> um, honestly, Ian, I would say that what has made me think from what the last participant said is that what we're not doing is bringing other, other voices into the room. So very related to that, we've got two development offices, one in Ireland and one in um, Australia, working to raise funds for in-country projects, but we're not linking enough in with the entrepreneurial spirit that is within our projects in countries. So I'm not sure, I, I would say I'm, that would be kind of a learning that I'm realizing more than saying that we've got a very good way of going about it. So, and I, I, I suppose what I would see even in this conversation as an opportunity for us would be um, better, prom better promoting and using the opportunities that already exist rather than always thinking outside of always thinking outside and for new things. So I think we're underutilizing our entrepreneurial spirit. Okay, um, Kamal, I, th I think um, I've used up more than my allotted time on, on this part of the um, discussion. Um, is this a good point to move, move on? Or, or I see Peter's got his hand up. Um, I think Peter had his hand up and um, there was a, a comment that came through um, on the group chat as well, which I'd quite like to read out if that's okay, Dan. Um, yeah, and then sure. and then perhaps we should move on to that. And uh, yeah. Um, so in addition to most of the contributions that have been brought up, Zilk has work groups that work towards achieving set strategies, which assist in creating common language amongst the members as they share same interests. Thus, it becomes easier for them to work on achieving their strategy as they would be having the same vision, passion, and it's easier to act on the strategy, thus strengthening their entrepreneurial spirit. So this idea of a kind of a, a common language that's shared um, uh, amongst the different working groups and across the organization. Um, and that's something that I, I saw when um, Consortia started to use the Kepler House to talk about different elements of strategic effectiveness, that it was a, that unifying element of a common language was incredibly useful for having those sorts of conversations, I thought. Excellent. Um, but sure, yeah, um, perhaps go on to the... Um, what about Pete? Peter's got his hand up as well. Um, sure. Okay, sorry, yes, j just a brief one, just building on that very good point about the need for uh, everyone in the organization to be committed to, uh, to, to being entrepreneurial and fundraising. Um, in my experience, that, that's where the link with whatever learning function there is, is really important because an awful lot of fundraising, in fact, depends on your monitoring, evaluation, learning systems. And therefore, the link between fundraising entrepreneurial people on the one hand and the uh, monitoring evaluation learning functions is really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'm going to um, move on to um, the next, next part of the presentation, um, which is um, the value model approach, which I'd like to share with you. Um, Zimbabwe and Kenya have already seen this um, before, and I believe um, Salk then shared um, some of this knowledge um, in Uganda at their regional meeting um, recently with, with, the, with the other consortiums. So some people will have seen this already, but um, I think it's um, um, you know, very important from my perspective um, if you want to achieve sustainability success financially. Um, and like I said, um, in my, in my work life, as, as an individual, I've, I've taken the value model approach. Um, and um, I'm not going to, in a few minutes, I'll explain why. <laughs> if I, I think if I say now, I'll, I'll give the game away. But um, <clears throat> I think the unsustainable reality of a lot of charities, a lot of organizations um, that we work with is, is that you, you're doing something absolutely amazing. Um, you, you've got a very, um, strong mission and vision and, and you're doing lots of great work on the ground but you're often short of funds you um, are often constrained by other resources that, um, that you would like to have which you haven't got and um, 
very often your people, which who are often volunteers um, predominantly, um, are, are overstretched and trying to do far more than, than they have time to do it. And they, they have many other um, matters that they should be focused on at work and at home. So that's the um, unsustainable reality. And um, <clears throat> it re really then means that you, you, you focus on money to create capacity and then the capacity to leverage the money. So you get stuck in this, this loop because you, know, you haven't got enough time, your people are stretched, I need more people, I need more buildings, I need more resources. Um, so you, you think I need more money. And so you get into this um, sort of unsustainable reality loop. Um, you know, you have lots of debates about priorities. Um, people are running around in lots of different directions, sometimes like headless chickens. Um, you have to jump through a lot of hoops for um, people that are fund funding you or supporting you. Um, you. And you don't really dare turn anything down that's offered to you, um, whether it's um, someone's time, um, a free computer that um, someone doesn't want anymore, um, or um, some money to do something, which isn't exactly what you wanted to do, but it's there and they're offering it to you. And um, so you try and be all things to all people. And um, you get this, you know, this very simple money capacity, eternal loop, which just saps your energy and it really, really pulls you down. It's a vicious circle. And um, there you go. It's a, it's a spiral that saps your energy and your organization's energy and also your optimism and, and your excitement and, and everything else. And um, <clears throat> you then, as a result of it, you, you fall into a number of traps um, or the, organ the charities I work with have anyway, and they start cost cutting or thinking about it. They, their, their thinking becomes short term and on much smaller issues than they, than they would have liked to think about. And they eventually become very afraid to take risks. So that, that's the problem with this, um, this sort of money capacity spiral downwards. And um, after a lot of thought and um, not really realizing that I was actually doing it anyway, I think you need to um, change the dimension of, of, of this reality. And um, you need to start with value um, instead of money. If you start with value, then I think it works. And it's very simple, but um, value attracts money. And when I mean value, I mean you demonstrate you know, your impact, your achievements, why, why, you know, why your organization exists. So the value attracts the money, the money will create capacity, and then more capacity will create more value. So you've just simply changed the two, the two sort of element model into a three element model. And it's, you know, it, start with this, this loop. And well, I didn't realize, like I said, I didn't realize it, but every job, every organization I've ever approached, I've actually, I've always positioned myself, sold myself, marketed myself from a value perspective. I've approached them and I've said, I don't mind what you pay me. I'm going to, I, I've got this value to you. I've got these skills. I've got these experiences. Or I will demonstrate um, an, a way of doing things that will be valuable to you. And I, once I've done that, within three to 12 months, you'll want to pay me the sort of money that I need to survive and, and, and exist. And so literally from the age of 20 to the age I am now, which is unfortunately a lot older, um, every charity, every business, anything I've ever done, any enterprise, I've always taken an individualist value approach to that organization. And you know, I suppose you could say it's a strengths-based approach. Um, you know, this is what I've got to offer and then, then it will have a value you know, that you can turn into money. And I think for the consortiums, for all charitable organizations, if you take this approach, you might succeed. It's another key element in, in, in the success approach. So, like I said, impact, value, you know, what, what, if you, what, what, it, what are you achieving? You know, what have you done? What, you know, what difference have you made as an organization? And, you know, so, Ask yourself as an organizer, start with that question. What impact do you want your organization to have or what impact is your organization having? 
And um, once you get going, it, <laughs> you'll need quite a bit of time because you'll find very quickly that your organization has had a lot of impact and done a lot of things. Um, and, they, and they're all valuable. Um, I think that the, the skill is, is, to, is to prioritize what, what, what impacts you've had, which are the most impactful, let's say, and, and, and get them as the headlines. And um, another way of um, finding out what you've done is, you know, who are your beneficiaries and who's, who's, you know, who's, um, you know, who, who's, you know, what are you there for and who are you helping and what have you done with, with people that um, your charity is there to serve? And, um, you know, who will be better off if you succeed? Ask these sorts of types of questions. And, you know, if, if you look at how you're measuring the success that you've had or the success that you intend to have, that will, get, that will give you lots of the answers and the information you need um, to, to come up with value and impact statements. Once you've um, got a clear, focused sense of the value and the impact that you, you want to have, um, you then need to decide who else cares. Okay, Who cares about that value? Who cares about that impact? Um, what organizations, what communities, what individuals um, care about that so ask yourself that and um because the money will uh, quite a lot of the money will come from people and organizations who care about your organization's value and impact not all the money because you can go into income generation activity and enterprise activity but if you can identify the people that care about the value and impact that your organization has then there some of those people will be will be willing to support you so, you know, think about natural fit. Um, like I said, who will benefit if they're associated with you? Um, and how what you're doing might be contributing to another organization's mission or another individual's mission. And um, then think how you might monetize that interest. Okay. And how you might get them involved. It sounds, it sounds, you know, how's that going to work but I, you know, I've practiced this and it does work and um, if you are if you're very clear about this people you know you very quickly will get people mobilized and interested and motivated to, to get involved and um, then you can sort of you know identify collaborative partners people you can work with people that will you know, really um, travel along the same road with you And like, 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 um, like we say in Capital Horizons, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I know it's, um, it's a well-used phrase, but um, I, I really, really believe um, that it's, it's a core component of um, our Capital Horizons community. Going, collaborating and go, going down that road with other, other organizations and other people will, will, will lead to much more success. So I've got some more questions. Um, we've got ten, rough, roughly 10 minutes for, for these questions. Um, and the first one, <coughs> which I thought might be worth the consortium um, participants thinking about and, and the people on, on, on this webinar is, you know, what national development indicators might improve as a result of the work of a consortium? If you think big picture, what difference are you making in Kenya, Ghana, Zimbabwe, and Uganda? what national development indicators you're affecting by your existence you're starting to answer the value question so that's the first question i'd like to open out to people what are what are the indicators so come on you've you've had longer than some to think about this um, if, if, if you've got any immediate um, thoughts about it the obvious links to consortiums and, and, and national development indicators. I, I, I mean, I think, to be honest, and I hope this isn't a cop-out response, I, I think um, the consortia have an important role to play in many different types of um, development indicators, primarily because of the, the, the value that they do have and the value that they have for a variety of different stakeholders. So, I mean, essentially what consortia help countries to do is access um, cutting edge research from around the world um, and put that at the fingertips of the researchers in their countries and um, 
and other people who might be interested in that latest thinking. Um, and that is a, is a gold mine for all sorts of different organizations within that country, um, not just uh, ministerial and government departments, not just universities, um, but potentially NGOs as well. Um, you're having um, resources that cost um, potentially um, a huge uh, amount of money that are being put at, um, uh, you know, support, in, enabling researchers to access that um, at discounted rates quite often. Um, and I think that's an incredibly useful thing, whether you're looking at issues to do with food security, whether you're looking at issues to do um, with education, um, primary school enrollment, all sorts of, um, so across the sustainable development goals, I think um, the service that consortia provide is hugely valuable. And I would be, um, I welcome other colleagues from INASP um, to, to sort of either dispute that or reflect on it or, or, or come in as well. Um. Um, Veronica or um, Anne or Mai, do you have um, a view? Um, well, I, I think I would um, agree with what Kimal said. Um, it would be because this um, is talking about national development indicators. So I think there's like various things that you could sort of pin the work of the consortia. Um, on Kamal was talking about the sustainable development goals, where I definitely see in a lot of them, I think there's also a goal around access to water and sustainable water, which I think is also very relevant. Um, but I think it would be interesting to hear from the consortia if they know of any national development indicators um, that could either be the same as for the sustainable development goals, or they could be mm -hmm. different um, where research that is being done in country is very important mm -hmm. and obviously that research in country is aided by having access to international research to inform the research that is happening in country. Mm -hmm. Thank you Mike. Um, Love more, can you still hear us? Yes, 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 yes Liver, you can. <clears throat> are we able to hear you, Love More? Be um, no, we're not able to hear you. Okay. Who? Sorry, James. Can you read that? The consortium becomes the core of national development. By core, it's the centre for the development of the country, such that what it produces is spread out to national. In, out to national development. This can be exemplified by its role to inform policy, advisory role, research and development, and above all, it will attract funding by its value and impact of not being idle. I could describe the consortium as an earthquake, <laughs> in this instance not destructive, but a nation building. <clears throat> Fantastic. I think that, I think that sums, I think as, a, as, a, as an overarching um, main statement about um, the benefit of, of consortiums in, in international development, that, that sums it up really, really well. Um, I think if you could then attach some detail um, to that, um, that would be, be wonderful. My, what, if, is that you or Veronica that's the hand up? That's me. Um, okay. I think I was basically just going to say what you just said is we've sort of men mentioned various um, examples for where the work of the consortia could be important, so for education, for food security, water security. I think what might be useful, obviously depending on which organization you want to talk to and show your value to and try to get on board on your work, is to maybe think through one specific example that's important to that organization rather than talking in these general broad terms that we've just been doing. So you really align it. So if you're going, I don't know, to the ministry and they are really interested in agriculture and food security, mm -hmm. then you actually think through and really expand on that example. Look, we have access to all of these resources. We know that this research is going on in this area in country. These resources can help inform that research. So you make it as specific as possible to try and show the value rather than talking in sort of general terms and around several issues. 
Yeah, thank you, Mike. That's really, really useful. Um, um, I, I also, you know, I think it, preparation is always key. Um, I think if you think about the, the strategic, uh, you know, the, all the development goals, um, <clears throat> the sustainable development goals, and, and have sort of link, linkages and answers to all of them, um, you're then prepared. And then, you know, when you, whoever you go and see or whoever you're talking to, you've got some immediate answers and some immediate sort of impact and value statements that you can share with them. Um, I would just encourage beyond the sort of global, um, really uh, motivating statements that you, you, you try and develop some detail um, and some real, um, some sort of beef to, to each, um, you know, each point you're trying to make. Because I think you can make, I think the consortiums or any, any charity can make some real hard factual links that, um, um, to, you know, of what their, their impact's having on national development, regional or local development. Would you mind if I would like to say something? I would like to add something again from my experience with CLISP because there I was quite impressed that I had the feeling that CLISP always reflects on also the national development priorities in the country. Uh, one example is that uh, one priority in Kenya is currently disability inclusion. And um, so CLISP has set up a working committee for special needs. And so they, I, I think it's important always to reflect again, what are the priorities, not also only for the, for the, for the own organization, but maybe also for the national development because the library consortia are such important organizations for national development because they, yeah, development, is always linked to research and to information, um, my feeling is. Thank you, Veronica. Okay, well, I'm gonna <clears throat> keep moving uh, along. And um, I have two more questions in this area, which I think might, might be useful to, to, to share with you. The, um, the, the next question, um, <laughs> um, which partners might be a natural fit for a library um, consortium? And I think this is really worth thinking about. And um, we, we, we looked at this in Kenya and, and in Zimbabwe. And when, when we did this, we, the list that we came up with was absolutely extensive. Um, it doesn't take long. But just to give you a flavor, um, you know, they came up with the African Library and Information Association. They came up with the Electronic Information for Libraries. They came up with the International Federation of Library Associations. Um, they've come up with um, you know, lots of different government ministries, research, national research institutes. Uh, non-governmental non organizations, regional and global research institutions. Um, you know, the list was extensive. I mean, I, I've, I've written down loads and loads and loads of things. There was the Goethe Institute, there was, um, there was Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, all sorts of different you know, publishers, digital media, um, people that were interested. The, the sorts of um, organizations that can partner with, with any charity are, are extensive, but yeah, I'd just like to throw that out and if anyone can, yeah, I've answered the question a little bit, but you know, who, who and what could, could the consortium partner with? What's a natural fit? And, and do you think you have a view on this? Um, I've probably missed quite a few things and we focused on this when we were in Harare together. She's just walking around now. Like <laughs> <laughs> tag. Pop and look over the shoulder again. I think your list was really good, Dan. I think it's one that we've been thinking through at NASP as well. Where is your natural fit? And it's sometimes a little bit of an extension to actually get to see it. But as you've kind of tied in with your first question, I think you can start making a value for almost any type of organisation from the library consortia. Mm. And I think it's really important these, when you're mentioning places like IFLA, a lot of these professional associations are really interested in getting involved in or sponsoring small projects. And I think there's, there's quite a lot of scope to be looking into those. And again, I know Zolk were busy talking about quite a long list of definite organisations, industry, um, company partners that they could be working with. Yeah. I might also be 
jumping the gun a little bit, but I can see it from the other way around in a case that Chris have been looking into working a lot more about disabilities because that's a national development priority. And I think you could probably find funding for disability work that then overflows into support to the consortium. So there's a different way around of looking at it that they've been going at it. But it just strikes me as an interesting route that they're taking in figuring out what's important and then how could the consortium show that they're contributing into that. Absolutely. Thank you, Anne. That's really helpful. And, and I, I, it, you aren't jumping the gun, but um, yeah, I think that, that that's the other question I had in this section, which is who else cares about being associated with you? Um, or, or what angles can you take and you know, what groups of people can you engage with? And um, you know, um, you've just mentioned one particular um, section of people, um, but I think there's many others. And I don't know if people have, again, had any thoughts on that, but the different types of, um, uh, of, of people that would like to be associated with a consortium or, or any charity activity. Dan, can I ask a question? Um, and it's really just, uh, so it's an interesting point that you raise there in the question that a natural fit for a library consortium, but is, is part of being entrepreneurial also thinking about where there's not immediately obvious fits, but there could be some really exciting and new areas for partnership and collaboration. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, making the case to a corporate body, for example, um, there might not be an immediately apparent natural fit, but when you start looking at the, um, the objectives of the business and then start thinking creatively about how you could help the business to meet those objectives. So I guess it's a question, can there also be an unnatural fit? <laughs> <laughs> and I think an obvious fit. An obvious fit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah. I, I think it will be a, it will be a natural fit because um, you will find, like you just said, that you know, um, profit based and, and non profit based organisations, you know, in their they're, they're trying to achieve similar ends, um, so that the fit will be natural, but but mm. maybe unobvious. Yeah. Um, I, I I gave a really poor example of it in, in Zimbabwe, which I'm going to give again for my <laughs> sin. But um, it's a bit like um, you know if you're um, if you're if you're the cornflakes at breakfast, um, you know, you, you, you know, your natural your natural fit is is the milk and the sugar, <laughs> um, or it's the it's the bowl and the spoon, um, or it's the table and the cloth, you know. It, <laughs> Or it's the breakfast room, you know, um, it can go on and on. There's different layers um, if you just start opening your mind um, and they're all essential to, for a good breakfast. Um, I think it's an appalling way of putting it, I'm, I'm <laughs> to put it that way. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, that's how it works. We've just had a comment come through. Um on the group chat um, saying very true when you mention corporate bodies because there's certainly some that would add value i.e we can't look at it with blinkers but we look at the industry wide as it is thinking out of the box um, kind of so I guess that's sort of um, picking up on picking up on the previous issue about sort of thinking creatively rather than obvious yeah rather than obvious fits. Absolutely are there any any final comments on this section that anyone would like to add um, before I move on? Um, Ian. Yes. Um, am I unmuted? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, again, I was just thinking just to broaden it out, Fiona, just to bring you in again as a different perspective. You've had a number of different questions there and hearing different contributions, but how would you look at that through your organisational lens at um, Edmund Rice? Hmm. I'm, I'm kind of going to not avoid the question but sort of answer it with the same as I did the last time in that it's, I would have had um, more experience of in my, my last role prior to Edmund Rice of, of working in, in this way of finding natural fits between supporters who may be donors or other types of supporters and the work we did and again I think because we've got sort of caught in the trap of what Dan said at the beginning of getting funding from specific donors, not having the capacity to manage it, and being, we've got ourselves stuck in that cycle of, of, of dealing with, the, of, of catching up with funders' requirements instead of looking more creative. Again, this is giving me huge food for thought about looking more creatively around 
the natural fit of other supporters, not necessarily major donors. I'm thinking a little bit differently about starting small and I keep thinking back on something Peter said earlier about using more of our monitoring and evaluation and learning to maybe bring more people into the pool that we just haven't been thinking about creatively enough because we have definitely got, got ourselves caught in that cycle of um, capacity and funding that Dan mentioned earlier. So I'm not sure that I'm, I'm, I'm I feel I'm gaining a lot from the conversation, but maybe not <coughs> contributing recent experience that might help others. Uh, thank you, Fiona. That's re that was really helpful and um, f very encouraging that um, it, it's, it's created some, some good food for thought with, for your organisation. Um, any other comments before um, we move on to the third section of, of, of the financial sustainability success matrix that I've come up with? I, I was just wondering if Simon had any reflections from having been out to Kenya um, and Ghana um, you know, and some of the things that he saw, because he did a lot of work around um, what's your brand story, and at the heart of brand story is the value proposition. So I'm just wondering if Simon had any kind of thoughts to share. Not specific on 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 the line that's going at the moment. Um, I think really it it what we I think in some respects we spent more time in Ghana with Carlig than we did with, with Klisk, looking at who else they might get involved with to, to create um, or to develop an entrepreneurial spirit. And really it was, it was a question of looking at the financial sustainability in terms of um, money income as opposed to just joint growth with other, with other companies. And it was looking at how could they, <clears throat> for example, with Carlig, they were very keen to have a permanent secretariat. And we looked at ways in which they could get sponsorship with other organizations that would look, uh, that would benefit from the research and development that they were, that they had at their fingertips as a library consortium, uh, but could provide some resource in exchange for that. So they would gain some access to research and development information and they would give some resource in exchange because they had the resource in place anyway in an office or or releasing somebody um, almost as, as an internship and looking at the internship it was then looking at because all of the consortia are university based or research institute based it was then looking at maybe involving students as well um, along that it, it's, it's going a little bit off piece from what we have been talking about but it, it's, it's within this financial sustainability mix that you can actually use the resource that you've actually got on site. And you would look for some, some, some of their time, um, but in exchange, you're giving access to how a, how a national consortium works and access to some top people within that. So those are the sort of things that, that we looked at. Thanks, thanks Simon. Um, I think Peter's got his hand up, if we could. Peter, would you like to make your comment? Uh, thank, thank you very much, Dan. No, I just thinking, you, you, starting from your initial question about national development indicators, um, a key stakeholder uh, of th that is really interested in that is the government, yeah. uh, the national government. And so I'm just wondering where, where that then leads you. Um, government, yes, is a natural fit in terms of the impact of the work. Um, I'm not quite sure where that leads you to in terms of um, being entrepreneurial about raising money, but maybe there's some sort of partnership one can think of uh, with government that might, might be productive. That's, that's a very valid um, comment, um, Peter. And um, mo I think most of the consortiums um, en engage um, quite closely um, with government departments in the countries that they're in, and, and they get receive government funding because because um, there's such a close link with um, you know the national development um, process. Um, but uh, this, I, th I think the INAS team and, and the consortium members are a far better place than me to, to, to talk about that. But, but certainly there's a lot of work ongoing and, and I think quite a number of government departments are members um, of the consortiums. Is, is that right, Kamal? And Anne, do you want to um, say anything? I'm just nodding across the table. Yeah, Anne's nodding across the table. So, so <laughs> 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 yes, that is right then. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on um, to the third element of, of, of the presentation this morning, um, 
and and that and that is um the, the i think the strategic analysis which is is absolutely vital for success um as, as i've already already well i will go back as i've already touched on um there are a lot of good ideas out there there's a lot of ideas out there um and um, some of them are about income generation they're about enterprise they're about um they might be about selling products and services or providing something that, that you can generate um a fee or you can raise an invoice for and and, and then the other side that there's a lot of people that are willing to fund you with money with time with um goods in kind um you know, whether it's businesses governments um or non-governmental organization etc cetera, etc cetera. many 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 different donors um but the, yeah really i think yeah i would encourage um the consortiums to take a strategic approach um to that and um we, we've spent quite a bit of time with the consortium um oh, excuse me um um talking about ansoft matrix which is a very simple um four box uh, model for for trying to get all the ideas on the table before you start deciding which are the best ones and which ones you want to do and which ones are appropriate for the consortium and we we used um this is an example of one of the, of the matrices we used for, for for the consortium which looked at um, um the services they could provide or, or are providing and the, and the members that they could engage with um to do um, to provide um, fees, subscriptions, memberships, um, income, and, and services, you know, it could be workshops, training, etc., etc., etc. We developed two different matrices, and the, the other one was around um, funding sources and resource needs. And I don't think I put that on there, no. Um, but these are just models, they're just tools that you use to develop ideas um, and hopefully to get all the ideas on the table. Uh, in, in a logical, um, objective, and, and, and broad-based approach. Um, so, so we spend quite a lot of time with the consortiums doing that. And there's other tools you can use. Um, I, I particularly like the Ansos, Ansos approach because you can um, tailor it to your needs. And on, on the on the Y and the X axis, you can um, you can insert whatever is appropriate um, that you're focused on. Um, it could be income generating activities instead of services. Um, it could be products um, on that access on members you know that, that could be um, other elements as well it could be um, the resources you need or um, you know it, it's just to bring out the ideas and um, it's worth spending some time on that so that so that, that's a strategic tool that I just um, we've touched on quite a bit with the consortiums already and they, they've then shared amongst themselves and the university members and um, so that that's the first thing but Sorry, Dan, can I just add that at the regional meeting in Uganda, we used ANSOS matrix as well, but we did tweak it slightly. So some people on this web webinar might have seen a slightly different version of what okay. we're now as well. Thank you, Mike. That's really helpful. And what version or, or, or what tweak did you, did you make? Is it relevant? Uh, if I remember correctly, we had the services as we have here, um, but then we put target group of beneficiaries instead of members. Okay. And, and so we had people work on filling out that matrix and then afterwards think about who might be interested in funding or partnering on the things they had put on their matrix. Excellent. Yeah. That already, you know, it, it evolved from, from the last time I met the consortiums, but I mean, it's just to prove the point. You, know, you, you, you use the tool to fit the purpose, to generate the ideas, but it's a strategic approach, it's an objective approach, and it's logical. And it's a very helpful tool to get the ideas on the table, because that, for me, is the first step. Um, but then once you've got all the, all the ideas on the table, you need to um, synthesize, and you need to um, probably remove the bad ideas or the weak ideas, um so that you've got the best ideas um but then you need to prioritize um you know because you can't necessarily do all the best ideas and that's where we use a sort of um, a short-term win quick win priority matrix and um again this is um, it's not new to a lot of the consortiums that we work with but um on the, on the x-axis we've got um, how much an idea costs um and on the y-axis we've got how much benefit um the, the sustainability, financial sustainability idea will bring. And um, 
again, this is um, a well-used tool that um, many of um, the Capital Horizons advisors uh, uh, are used to. But in, 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 in a strategic process, which is usually three to five years, if you, if you wait for all your achievements and all your, out, your results um, for, for the end point, you're going to, I think you're going to lose your team, you're going to lose motivation, you're going to lose inspiration. So I would encourage um, some of your income generating and fundraising ideas to, to be quick wins. And when I mean quick wins, I mean in the first 12 months, um, once you've got your plan put together. So although you're going to have some longer term uh, financial sustainability activity, you need some short term quick wins as well. And that's um, within 12 months, things that are going to happen to make a difference. Um, it might be generating um, a, you know, just a, a small amount of dollars um, or the, you know, Kenya shillings or, 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 or what, you know, whatever. Um, but it's very important that you see some income for your, for your effort um, and a return on your investment as quickly as possible. And, and that you sort of plan f for things to come on stream through, through your strategic period. And um, this matrix will hopefully um, help you do that. Once you've got all your ideas um, out on the table, you can score them. And you can give them a score between one and five on benefit and one and five on cost. One being low, five being high. Um, so, you know, if you give an idea, uh, um, a low, you know, a one on cost and a five on benefit, it will go into the quick win box. And it just gives you a very easy and um, quite effective way of synthesizing and siphoning all your ideas that you've got out through the Ansos process um, into which ones are quick wins and which ones are going to take longer and might cost more. So it's just a very simple tool that we, we use quite effectively in Zimbabwe and, and, and Kenya and hopefully um, will be share, shared with the other consortiums. But the, the questions, well, I put some examples of um, some, some, what I think might be quick wins um, down, just to give you an idea for the consortium. And um, they were sort of like merchandising and products, training and development services, conferences and workshops. These are all things which um, are relatively easy to do and can be done in, within the, the next 12 months. Um, you know, certain publications which they might be able to earn fees from, um, increasing their membership or subscriptions. Um, so they're just some examples of the things that came out when we were with the consortiums, but the list was much, much longer than that. But they're quick wins, and I think they're all things that can be done relatively um, quickly within the 12 months. But the, the question I, I, I have for people now is, you know, what, what are what did they actually feel were the most effective quick wins um, that, that, that were mentioned um, or that they're using? And also, how many do you think are realistic to achieve in, in a 12 month period? Because, um, you know, you, you, could, you could come up with a list of 10 or 15, but yeah, what's realistic? And maybe that's a difficult question to answer, but um, I, I just want people to, to, to really think about what's realistic. How much time, how much capacity, how many people, how, how many resources have you actually got to achieve the ideas that you can come up with? So, th th so that's, um, that's what I want you to think about uh, from a strategic perspective. But please feel free to um, throw in any other strategic um, viewpoints or, or angles that you think are, would be useful in, in this area um, or comment on those questions. Do I have any hands up? <laughs> Dan, I was just wondering if we could ask her um, if, if we've got Nina back again, um, because I remember last time I was out in Ghana and Simon and Jean had been out in Ghana subsequently, but um, we were talking about developing promotional materials using the brand story that had evolved through um, the various forums that we'd been on. And that um, <laughs> almost immediately after forum two, um, we had a meeting whereby um, people who with marketing expertise came in and started talking about those promotional materials. So I'm just wondering, I didn't want to put Nina on the spot, but I'm just wondering if they saw this as the kind of a quick win opportunity that then can start um, spreading messages um, about what the consortia do. 
And we got Nina back. Nina, can yes. you hear us? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Nina. Uh, yes, apologies. Um, I had a student come in and I had to, I had to sort of leave for a little bit. No problem. Um, I mean, we we actually took some steps towards doing something, but in the end, um, sort of end of the year financial issues kind of took over. So. Um, but there is one quick win, uh, it's not very quick, is that, for instance, Calic is having a, having a big conference um, in the middle of this year, which is kind of being, basically being run on a self-financing um, basis. So even although we would try to get some kinds of um, sponsorship, um, we're actually going to charge fees for participation, both from Calic members and non-Calic members. Um, so that is one way of making a little bit of money. Um, you know, uh, and we're, we're actually working on that now. At least there's a planning committee that's doing that. So, I mean, the, 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 if that doesn't, you know, sort of leave out the whole business about the promotional materials, because I think we will revisit that. Um, and it's just sort of gone slightly below the radar, but it's it's not forgotten, if you know what I mean. But I yeah. think the conference is like the big thing for us this this particular year, at least until July, and it happens. Can I just ask a question, Nina, about who who are, who's likely to attend that conference? And could there be opportunities for, um, you know, creative partnerships as a result of people you're going to have in that room? Um, well, I mean, we, we certainly will invite, obviously, all the Calic members. And then there are all the potential members. Um, obviously, a lot of members of Ghana Library Association get invited. I think the publishers and sponsors um, are being invited and because the theme is actually to do with research and research data the invitees you know are being extended to people who are involved in research generally um, and specific research uh, in the universities especially but there is also internet there are also international people who are being invited Excellent. And, and Nina, how, how did um, taking the strategic approach to um, all, all the different ideas that um, could be carried out, how, how do you feel, that, I mean, is that something that's been shared with you already or, or um, is this quite new? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I remember seeing it from the, the meeting in Uganda. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's, it's kind of also a matter of, you know, how much decision making you know who does the decision making so yeah. there 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 is probably going to be some more discussions about things um where we're going to have a sort of meeting of a governing council which is all the members of calic probably sometime in february and then i think there'll be also more discussion then um but i think capacity wise probably the conference is the big thing um, and then we see, you know, what we can get out of that. And, and uh, you know, like all of these conferences, you, you do make contacts uh, and so on, not just for individuals, but also for, for the consortium. I think, I think what resonated really strongly with me, Nina, with, with workshops and conferences um, and, and meetings of the gatherings of this sort, is it, it does tick quite a number of boxes. It doesn't just... Um, it, it can be a financial um, or an income generating um, process, but it it works on lots of other fronts, you know, um, with advocacy, with, um, you know, in, your networking and, you, you know, and part, you know, all sorts of relationship building processes. So, so that's, it's it's a multi, you know, faceted approach, I think, which work, you know, really makes sense to me for, for a consortium. Well, I mean, we've had two of these um, already. The first one was very successful. The, less, the second one, not too bad, but it didn't get very much international input. So this, this year, the aim is to get more people from outside. And we're actually already working with the Association of African Universities is kind of a 
a partner because we're using their venue, um, but they're also working with with them to sort of do publicity and perhaps do some pre-conference workshops. Um, so I think that that's that's probably you know we're we're trying different approaches each time we do it and we learn each time. Excellent, thank you. And um, um, Rory, Rory Sangsabata, can can you hear us? If you is there anything you'd like to add to some of these questions um, on strategy? Can we? We just check it. Or anyone else from Zulk. I, I think if there were anyone else from Zulk would be wonderful because, um, I mean, just reflecting on the regional conference in Uganda, Zulk did a wonderful presentation on the ANSOS matrix and thinking strategically um, about those, um, the, 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 the key issues you're picking up, um, Dan. Uh, and it would be very interesting to hear from anyone. Uh, I think we have a comment just, just now in. Um, yep. Uh, conferences and workshops do go a long way as a quick win, but I always feel like we meet and discuss and it doesn't really go further on. That's a very interesting point. <laughs> very interesting point. And, uh, um, I suppose that comes back to the, the vision, passion, action point we you know, made earlier, isn't it? Uh, and um, having having the space and, and the processes to allow allow action to actually occur. And I think probably also trying to be realistic because if you plan too much and there's just no way you can do all of it, I can I think it can sort of drain the energy from people because they can see from the beginning that it's not really going to happen. So that exercise of prioritizing and choosing what capacity you have and what's realistic to do, I think, um, is really important as well. Thank you, Ma. Yes, definitely. Absolutely agree with that. And, and have, we got, have we got anyone else from Zimbabwe on the line? Is Love more there? There was a, a little bit of an addition to that um, comment um, that came in talking about my thinking is maybe trying to establish communities of practice. And that's actually very timely because we were having that discussion in our team meeting this morning about the value of communities of practice, online um, groups that enable people from across different countries and different consortia to come together and share ideas. Um, and that can be shared practical learning about advice on negotiations, but it also can be, um, you know, spaces in which people can think creatively. Um, we've had some thoughts as a team about how effective those communities of practice can be, but it's very interesting to um to see that um you know that there are thought that they are they are potentially useful spaces i don't know if anyone has um any further thoughts on um on that um um Thembe, do you um do you, do you want to add anything to um, um to this discussion Thembe saying let me try to type quickly <laughs> so she's typing away um, any other, um, anyone else want to talk about um, the strategic side of um, um, financial sustainability? Any other experiences? P Peter's got his hand up. Do you want to go, Peter? Oops. We can hear you now, Peter. Okay. Make an, a, an obvious point to, uh, to complicate your priority matrix. So, in a way, it should be in three dimensions because I think. There's something about the speed of benefit, and then there's something about the scale of benefit. And I think typically your quick wins will be um, high speed, but relatively small scale. Yeah. And then there's another set of benefits which are slow, but much more substantial. And that's maybe your, your long-term goals. <clears throat> so you could in theory make this a three-dimensional three matrix with cost, um, speed of benefit, and scale of benefit. Uh, it's a really helpful input, and um, I'll, I'll talk to people more technical than me to see if we can make it three-dimensional. <laughs> no, I think that I think that's very very true. Definitely, um, you, you need to realise that the models can be over, oversimplify things, and, and, and you mustn't oversimplify them. Um, that's very important. Okay, any other comments before we um, we sort of wrap up? I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, okay, I'm going to just quickly zip forward. <laughs> um, 
Uh, we've had a comment in, Dan. Um, Thembi's just uh, been rapidly okay. typing. My thinking is that communities of practice go a long way in keeping the quick wins alive because often they just become a short-term activity that does not go a long way, yet it could have been furthered and developed into something tangible that can benefit the consortium. I'm happy that INASP has been considering having communities of practice as a way forward. They really would come in handy. Um, that's a, a, a really interesting insight. And I, I, I guess I don't want to sort of complicate the discussion we're having, which is around financial sustainability. But one of the critical issues, technical issues we were facing with the communities of practice is having someone to moderate them as forums um, and sometimes they can um, you know without that sort of critical input to support the moderation of the community of practice they can sometimes um, you know fail to generate the life that they need to um, and perhaps we can link that to the kind of the, the issue of entrepreneurialism and financial sustainability because having someone driving um, or you know having a group driving entrepreneurial spirit is really important for an organization isn't it so I think with the community of practice it's also really important to have um, I, it comes back to your value action um, sense of purpose um, and drive I guess Dan absolutely and um, you know if all the consortiums are all, are all working on the same issue um, maybe that would be a great way forward if they could have a collaborative you know cross consortium approach to this and maybe um, that would be a better use of their resources that you know um, you know if they, if they form a group a working group that, that agrees to work on this on the benefit of all the consortiums absolutely I don't know if my colleagues want to come in on that but I think that with their sort of general consensus and head nodding um, in the room that that sort of idea about you know as spaces to share learning um, across country borders um, and using technology that um, you know they, they offer wonderful opportunities but require input and um, you know a, a sense of drive and energy within those spaces yeah okay well I, I I've come to the end of what I wanted to share with you um, and I've had you know, really appreciated all the comments and, and, and involvement and um, so I'm going to hand back to you Kamal um, to sort of wrap up. Yeah well I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Dan obviously for um, in that incredible amount of work um, uh, developing the uh, all of those ideas and sharing with us, um, you know, thoughts about financial sustainability. And um, I always enjoy listening to Dan talk about um, cultivating the entrepreneurial spirit um, because, you know, I find that very energizing and motivating. And I'm sure um, I, I, I've seen it firsthand in the countries when Dan has talked to people about that. It's generated very lively um, engagement and um, it's been wonderful to have Dan deepening that learning through this webinar. So thank you very much, Dan. Um, and thank you everyone who's participated. Um, it's not always easy with the technology um, sometimes, uh, but I think uh, you know it's, it's a really potentially very exciting space for um, not just uh, Kapler and Enas to share ideas, but also um, library consortium partners to share ideas. And uh, um, even if the technology isn't always 100% perfect, I think the idea and the sentiment behind sharing um, learning across um, across these borders is, is a wonderful opportunity for consortia. So just, just to say thank you very much everyone for participating in this. Um, it's been wonderful to have these leading in the library webinars um, and I hope um, that ongoing collaboration and, and it will enable these sort of spaces to um, continue to be um, an opportunity to share learning. So thank you very much everyone and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Right.